Welcome to Human Centered, a series of short conversations with researchers at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University. The center was founded in 1954 to encourage interdisciplinary research focused on the most pressing societal issues of our time. Each year, a range of scholars, scientists, and government officials come to spend a year studying contemporary societal problems. My name is John Markoff. I'm a science and technology writer and former reporter for the New York Times. In these conversations, we've set out to find interesting projects at the center that shed new light on the way we think about society. This week, I'm talking with Jacob Ward, who is one of this year's fellows at CASBIS. Jacob is in the midst of reporting a book about the effects of artificial intelligence on human decision-making. He has a diverse background in science and technology reporting, ranging from being editor-in-chief of Popular Science magazine to serving as a television correspondent for Al Jazeera, covering science and technology. This week, we spoke about the techno-utopian movement and its relationship to Silicon Valley. So I'll dive right in because we sort of started to have this conversation about techno utopianism, mm-hmm. this idea that technology solves all societal right. and economic problems. Right. And I was particularly interested in talking to you more about it because I've been struggling with it with relationship to my character in the biography I'm writing, mm-hmm. Stuart Brand, right. who's been labeled as a techno utopian in some cases. Right. And it, my sense about his role and his uh, impact is it's much it's nuanced. Mm, that's right. And, that's right. And um, uh, the first thing I think I, w- I wanted to ask you is, it has I mean, you're you're writing about AI now in the Valley. Has this come up at all in your project? Oh. So maybe you could talk a little bit yeah. about your project and sure, um, it's endless. It's endless. So I'll start just with a little bit of background that I, I, you know, I've struggled with this question of of utopianism sort of throughout my career, and you know, I, I consider my career to be a small sliver of of your career, and so it's fine to be talking careers with you. Uh, but, uh, but I, you know, I was the, at, at like 20, you know, in my early 20s, I became a reporter for the industry standard way back when. And it was a, it was the early, for anybody who doesn't know, it was the early uh, business magazine of the internet. It was a print edition, which is ridiculous, but that's totally what it was. And, and the, there was a tremendous amount of utopianism going on there, or not so much the utopianism, but it's the thing that I'm sure you've encountered too in among business reporters where there's this sort of, it's almost irrelevant to talk about the long-term effects of a thing, irrelevant to talk about the social effects. The thing that we're really interested in is, will this company work? Will it stay afloat? Will it get across the desert, you know, the valley of death and get to market, right? Will it get punished by its shareholders? What are the boardroom intrigues? So the kind of the, the intellectual currency of covering those companies at that time had nothing to do with what I, as a cynical 20-something liberal arts major, wanted to talk about, which is, Will this stuff be good for society? Why are black people being excluded from the investment community? Uh, you know, why do companies uh, cave to political pressure when they have, a, have Planned Parenthood as a client, which is one of the st- stories I got. So I, I quit that job a couple of years into it at a time when that, co- when that magazine was flying and they had offered me, you know, you could go to New York, you could go to wherever, to, why would you leave? And man, I just couldn't do it anymore. I just thought, I just can't cover this with, in this sort of blinkered way. But then, fast forward several, you know, to many years later, and I'm the editor-in-chief of Popular Science magazine, and at Popular Science... You can't escape. You can't, well, I can't escape, right? I mean, you just can't escape it. But at Popular Science, I had decided, okay, I'm going to go ahead and embrace the utopianism of this brand because Popular Science had always been a solutions-oriented magazine and I was struggling at that time to figure out how do we compete with somebody like Wired, one of the you know best resourced magazines in our competitive set. And Wired, uh, I, I sort of, the story I would tell was that Wired was all about kind of a lot of, that Wired was doing a lot of hand-wringing but not a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of investigative work and a lot of hand-wringing but not a lot of solutions. And we're going to be all about solutions. And so I was constantly drawing on this utopian past of right. popular science, where you had these contributors, you know, uh, you know Steinbeck, you know these these August figures, saying Steinbeck in the '60s was writing about wanting to go to the bottom of the ocean. Forget going to, to space. Let's go to the ocean. So that's a, that's sort of as reactionary as anybody got at that time. Um, and so for for me, I had to sort of dress up in a utopian 
uh, posture, okay. kind of. Yeah. You know, at, and at how many years did you do that? Which years? Which so, were you at? So I was at Popular Science for seven years okay. in total, and I was the editor in chief for I like to say two years, but it was really about a year and a half. Up to uh, so I left Popular Science in 2013. Okay, well, so uh, yeah, you so know, well, that's a really important time frame because yeah. now we have this AI debate. So the, the dot com era. Um, you know, the collapse, 2000, 2001, the resurrection after 2008. Right. Here we come into the, the teens. Right. And now there's this AI debate, and the, the subtext is all about uh, technological utopianism. Yeah. And people are trying to, it's different, I guess is my feeling, than those, those two periods that you were That's right. so engaged and backed away and then got That's right. sucked in. I like to think that it's different, or I, I believe that it's different, because we have a deeper uh, and more sophisticated understanding of what technology is doing to human behavior and to the human mind than we used to. I think that we, so that's, that's the subject of my book, is, right. is you know, how AI is going to sort of shape human behavior by not just sort of amplifying certain mental habits, but in fact creating new mental habits, which we're beginning to see. And so one thing that, that it, you know, I think it used to be that, that people thought of only tangible industries or industries that dealt with tangible products as being extractive industries, right? That you mine a, a commodity until it's gone, right? And, and that the digital world was just dealing with this open-ended, infinite resource, uh, you know, our, our but, but what we're finding, and this is how I got led to this project, was I, I did two years working on a documentary about human behavior and how we get manipulated based on sort of fundamental human programming that psychology has revealed to us in the last 50 years. Um, what we've learned, what I think psychologists are beginning to figure out, sociologists too, is, is that companies that deal in our attention and seek to shape our behavior with their products are in fact also extractive. And that, and that we have a finite amount of bandwidth, we have a finite amount of cognitive uh, uh, horsepower to give to any given task. And if you burn it during the day, you don't have a lot left. And so I think for me, that's a big part of it, is that the quantifying of human attention as a commodity that is now bought and sold has changed the way that we think about these companies. Well, that's come to the fore in uh, the sort of the aftermath of the 2016 election, yeah. particularly in um, all of these questions raised by the relationship to Facebook and Cambridge Analytica sure. and whether this guy Robert Mercer and Bannon actually systematically used right. these technologies in a new way, right, right. a fundamentally new way. Uh, and, yeah. uh, and so that's playing out on a national stage. And I'm trying to understand sort of how it's changing Silicon Valley. Yeah, that's right, that's right. I mean, I think, you know, w one thing that I think, I mean, I think there are many, many things at work, you know, for me, I had a handful of reckonings. You know, w one was in, when I was a, uh, so I, I, when I left Popular Science, I became a television correspondent for Al Jazeera, and Al Jazeera was a fabulous place to work because they had no, I mean, as you and I have both experienced, right, there's a certain amount of ne benign neglect you get from your, from your masters when you, when you cover the stuff that we cover. And at Al Jazeera, they were really only interested in science and technology in as much as it could illustrate social inequality and help us understand a little bit more about the social inequality at the heart of the United States and other places. But the, uh, so in 20, whatever it was, 2014 into 2015, as the, as the revelations came out that the NSA had been surveilling people using Silicon Valley's products, you got this incredible sense that, oh, wow, this stuff is not as sort of innocent and convenient and just about entertainment as we thought it was. Um, you know, I remember filing a report at that time pointing out that if, you know, if something like the Nest system, which knows when you're coming and going from your home, you know, knows the patterns of your behavior, I mean, that is a surveillance agent's dream. And yeah. if that thing had the NSA logo on it, you would drown that thing in the bathtub, right? You would never put that in your house. Yeah. But somehow because it's capitalist and it's America, we think, yeah, it's fine. This is totally cool. Yeah. So that for me was a big turning point. And then, tw I remember December 2016, Gary Kasparov uh, was pointing, was one of the first people to start pass uh, pointing out that, that the products we make here in the land of the free are being used in other places to undermine our values. And that is a, uh, that was such a prescient thing to point out. And I think is, is, for me, was a really transformative thing that, oh yeah, this stuff, 
you know, is, is, is not innocent and it's not just convenience and entertainment. And now you see all these people, I mean, I have friends, right, who've fallen out of the business of tech um, for moral reasons because they say to themselves, my God, the thing I was building is being used exactly as I intended it, exactly. <laughs> and, it and look what it's doing yeah. to all of us. Well, so how deep into the Valley's culture, I mean, I see that too. I see it in the yeah. engineers who are developing AI technologies, right. but I don't have a good sense of whether that's becoming a fundamentally a fundamental part of Silicon Valley culture. You see it in right. companies like Google, where they, you know, the employees sort of rebel against doing yeah. work for the military. Yeah. But go up to the C-suite. That's right. And what's going on there? Um, I worry that organizations like the Partnership for AI. Mm -hmm. Are I don't want to say lipstick on a pig, but Go are ahead, man. <laughs> you know? But I don't trust. That's right. I, I don't trust the, the that we're going to get to uh, to this new place simply by having sort of, you know a, a new set of ethical standards. You still right. may need regulations. I think that's or, absolutely right. I think that that there is a. I mean, one thing that we have we have also seen at the same time that we've begun to commoditize uh, human attention and human behavior uh, through these products. I think these companies have also gotten excellent at commoditizing the idea of being quote unquote woke companies. Yeah. You never meet a head of HR anymore. You only ever meet people who are the head of people and culture. You know, the every company, it doesn't matter what they're selling, has perfected this line that we are improving the world, we're changing the world, we're here to do well and we're here to do good. We're going to make you money, but you also get the satisfaction of improving this world of ours. Yeah. And I mean, supposedly 30, 40 years ago, you could, you, you had your choice as a products company like Procter & Gamble of the top 10 business graduate, business school graduates from all the, the best MBA programs in the country. Today, supposedly you cannot hire those kids unless you have a great message about how you're working on climate change or you're working on social justice or whatever the thing is going to be. So it's become part of the, the business culture of hiring these kids. Here's the problem though is, you know, so I was at a thing the other night where there was a bunch of sort of mid-level Google, Facebook, other people and each of them was could articulate the line that they wouldn't cross. Uh, uh, you know, w one guy was saying, oh, I work on a thing that, that um, uh, that allows employers to know when their employees are at their desks, and so there'll be a certain amount of sort of surveillance there. But but I think that you know I know that I won't go to, I won't go any further than that. He said, yeah. you know, and and so everybody's got their own little uh, their own private uh, uh, social mores that they have you know their own ethical lines they've drawn, and they know that selling AI to the Pentagon is on the far side of it, because it's a cartoonish example. But there's no coordinated effort within these companies among the rank and file to say, oh, this is, actually the line is closer to where I live and closer to, to my day-to-day -day life. Like, that stuff has not been figured out yet. And I think you're right. I mean, I'd be curious to know, because you know better than I do about the C-suite people. Why aren't they... Like, what ultimately limits their ability to be moral about this? Well, I think that the problem is that they're, they've just been too successful. And I, I mean, I, I look at, I mean, to, to name names, I look at people like uh, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, um, mm -hmm. who started out, who I, I knew when they were in the garage. And, um, right, you know, right. they were the children of university professors. Um, they, you know, they had this, the, the courage to have this statement as part of the founding principles of their company, don't be evil. Yeah. And then they, you know, they just got trapped in this, in what they created, which was wealth on a scale that we've never seen before. Yeah. And they were, I mean, you know, I just see them as individuals who were sort of moved by their success in some way that they don't have control That's of. That's right. And so they may have these values, but um, they're stuck by, by what they've done to the world. That's right. I think that's exactly right. I, I also... I think there's an allergy in the Silicon Valley culture to history and to, um, you know, really almost any study outside of what they're immediately doing. Uh, you know, y you, you hear people sort of saying, you know, well, we shouldn't, we don't, we don't need to look to the past. You know, we're all about the future. We're here to disrupt things and make them better. Anything, anything that came before needs to be broken in some way. And, and which is why I think it's so wonderful that you and I get to spend the time at a place like this, right, at Casbis, where, yeah. you know, for me, I, every time I mention some dynamic you know, at work in Silicon Valley, somebody here says, oh yeah, well, you know, here's 50 years of scholarship on that problem uh, that's been sorted out. And I just think to myself, wow, man, like why aren't, yeah, why aren't the Larry Pages of the world here asking social scientists, okay, well, tell me about legitimacy. Tell me about 
you know, quotas. Tell me about, you know, all these efforts that social and political scientists have made to codify human values in the past, and, and suddenly these companies are, are realizing they may have to do that and they don't know how. So there hasn't been, so the, the, there hasn't been a real reframing of this techno-utopian impulse is, is sort of what we come down to. It's right. still very I much alive. Right. There's been no, for example, there's nothing we would call a privacy or a technology Chernobyl in Silicon Valley, despite the fact that mm -hmm. these guys have been pulled in front of Congress. That's right. Nothing on the scale that's going to change things in a, in a you know, 180 degree way. I think that's right, and I and it and it makes you wonder what it would be. I mean, you know, if we were in a more, uh, if we were in a different environment, you know, it'd be pretty easy to say it would be the money, right? That that a lawsuit or a, you know, some sort of, uh, I don't know, some you know some some other you know hit them hit them where they live kind of kind of effort might might make the difference. But I don't know how you affect the bottom line of these companies at all. It's almost impossible to imagine a, an event bad enough that it would actually. You know, Amazon's clearing what? Like a, it's some crazy number. Of, it's profit a day. I is, think is uh, insane. Yeah, right? and I think um, um, Google is at about two billion dollars a month. Yeah, in, right. In I mean, profit, so profit so we're not Close talking. These are yeah. not. You can't use the cigarette company strategy uh, to you know to to uh, sue them and scare and, and make them change their policies yeah. that way. Um, you know, I was just looking at a. Or I was just in a in an environment. Sorry, I, I was just in a. Um, uh, Meeting yesterday uh, with a, some of the sort of leading national lights on on um, uh, sexual harassment in the in um, academia and uh, people who had been some of the authors of the um, National Academy's report on sexual harassment and they were really interesting because they they are thinking of the the how to fight this stuff in the same way that I think a lot of people are thinking about it in Silicon Valley. Do you? Can you rely on the good intentions of a, of a moral leader, right? Somebody who thinks like Zuckerberg seems to and Larry Page thinks to. I have the, you know, I have the, the good, I have good intentions here. It's yeah. me, it's Mark. You can trust me. You know, I've got good intentions. I've been with you all this time. You know, the, they say you can't trust that. And you also can't trust a, a purely legal regime to come in and correct this stuff because it's, I mean, they didn't say this, but I, my read is it's too dumb, you know, and and it doesn't account for all kinds of subtle stuff that doesn't fall under the technically illegal category. Instead, they talk about you change the structure of the place, uh, and in their case, they were talking about changing things like flatten the relationship between an advisor and a and an advisee, so that the power dynamic is not as strong. Um, things like that, I, you know, and I don't know that there are any lessons to be carried over, but I know that. The argument that Silicon Valley seems to make, which is, we we are utopians and, and it's a and we have everyone's best interests at heart and we're going to figure this stuff out the way we always have. Just trust us. That's not going to work. And and I believe regulation is going to be necessary in some way, but man, it doesn't doesn't make me encouraged when I hear those guys, you know, a senator trying to even understand what Facebook oh, does. Oh well, that, that and that takes me to this administration, right? And. Do you have any sense of how this administration will play in respect to Silicon Valley? Will they be Silicon Valley's friend? Will they be their foe? You know, we have these techno-utopians still. How is yeah. the Trump administration going to respond? You know, I think that that the the Trump administration is on the is simultaneously so, uh, um, you know, simultaneously understands that there is some sort of you know, I think I, I always try to remember that, like, for that there is no such thing as a political. You know, nobody in elected office does anything unless it has some sort of political reason to do it. You, there's the rightness of the position, but then there's it's got to earn you votes in some way, and those two things have to come into alignment for people to do the right thing. And so, I think that there is probably some sense that um, people can sense that that technology is not necessarily having the best effect on society, that it is you know, div causing us to be more divisive. I think people are sen sensing that. On the other hand, I think the Trump administration depends so much more than anyone has in the past on these platforms to do what it does to, to stoke the emotions that it tries to stoke. And, you know, I mean, by 2020, when we're seeing, you know, the re-election campaign in full swing, you'll see, you know, they're going to be arm in arm with these platforms again. So it's, I don't see them correcting anything anytime yeah. soon. So, I, you know, looking at the arc of these ideas, I mean, this sort of 
Technutopian debate came up around the dot com era. It's actually been almost two decades in a sense. I mean, you know, yeah. I remember sort of being very sympathetic with John Perry Barlow's uh, original uh, manifesto in in uh, in uh, Wired. You know, that that yeah. was the sort of in some ways that was emblematic of techno utopianism. Right. And then, you know, as I saw the cyber stuff happening. I fell away, and I began to realize that the you know the internet wasn't a utopian environment; it was simply a mirror of the world, and it mm. reflected everything. Mm. And so I I shifted, and and then when this last election happened, I realized that you know we had thought that the internet would push democracy to the world, and then we realized that the internet was actually a two way street. Yeah, it comes back, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and that was you know that was sort of in the in the uh, in the mirror sense. But what what I think we're we're missing or what hasn't appeared on the stage. My friend Paul Sappho, who's a, you know, a forecaster, he likes to call himself, yeah. who's been around the valley as long as I have, um, likes to say what we need now and what isn't here is a new religion. Mm. And mm. you know, here at CASBIS, um, there is this project uh, called the New Moral Political Economy. Right. Um, and you know, it is this um, effort which is trying to recapitulate uh, the things that led to neoliberalism. Mm. So I, you know, when I put it in that framework, I think, well, maybe that's a good idea. Maybe, maybe the academics have something to provide. But, you know, I don't see it coming anywhere else. And so I don't see this no. fusion of technology and some sort of new um, ideology, I guess, well, I, happening. I guess I would just say, you know, for, for me, I, and I'm cur really curious to hear your, your opinion on this, you know, I think that when the primary users of the internet were, and, and the primary developers of the internet were largely academics, or at least people from a from a pretty direct academic environment, um, then that was the world it was reflecting. And and among academics, and I hear this a lot at Casbus, it's the one place that I find myself sort of departing from the people that I that I hear. People talk about measuring social difference or measuring, uh, uh, you know, a, a gap in society, a problem like that in order to fill that gap, in order to solve that problem, that they're, that they're going to, that, you know, you, you find a disadvantage in order to compensate for it. That's why you study them. And so I think that spirit was there with the internet. We're going we're gonna to use it to fill these gaps in society, to push democracy to places that doesn't have it, to give economic opportunity to people that don't have it. Well, that you, it turns out you don't make as much money that way in the short term as you do doing other things like capitalizing on people's disadvantage and driving wedges between human beings. And as soon as the, the user base and the, and the developer community within the internet became mostly people who, who work in that world, who are you know, professional money makers, then you have a whole other, I think, set of, of guidelines that, that begin to, yeah. to run it. And you know, for me, I, 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 so I continuously hear people say things like, you know, so like in my book, right, looking at questions of bias and human error, uh, I'll give talks to, to companies about that, and, and, and I'll always have some uh, bright-faced engineer write a hand, raise a hand and say, you know, well, can't we use AI to compensate for these biases, to compensate for these things? And I think to myself, that is, and I say, sure, if money weren't part of it, totally. You know, but you don't get to make money compensating for people's disadvantages. You instead make money by capitalizing on it. You know, I remember one of the stats that, that changed my world and made me, and I try, to, I try to remember it in every single thing I do, is that in 2016, uh, the, uh, Pew came out with a study that showed that 49% of, of Americans could not put together an extra $400 yeah. in an emergency, yeah. in cash, right? They'd have to borrow that money from somebody, the bank, check cashing place, whatever it would be, a, typically a, a part, you know, a, a grandparent or something, right? But that's a parking ticket, right? That's like you, you park in the hand, handicapped spot because you were trying to drop off your kids yeah. or you know, you're, you lose a tire on the highway or whatever the thing is, right? That's you suddenly in the red. And for me, I, I, I realized, oh my God, like we don't need a lot more efficiency in making money in this world. We, we are doing it. Like, yeah. it, you know, Florida, 50% of Florida right now, everyone can't make its ends, can't make ends meet. Well, what's right. the number? Three people, Buffett, Bezos, and Gates. Is it those three? Yes, mm -hmm. those three people have the wealth of the bottom half of the population right. in right. this, this you country. Know, so we're not compensating for disadvantages. We're, yeah. America is not in the business of doing that. So then you get to this, I mean, techno-utopianism and this discussion about whether uh, these new technologies are actually accelerating inequality. Mm. And that's what, yeah. I mean, maybe that 
debate is not enough on the table, certainly not framed in any national way. It's right. happened in Piketty's discussion, I guess, yeah. at Capital. But yeah. if, there's, if these technologies are, by displacing labor with capital, are going to accelerate yeah. inequality, we're right. just seeing the beginning of this. That's right. There's a lot of smart economists, right, working on these on questions of, like, the gig economy and, and the rest of it. You know, the, I, I always try to find, I'm, I'm always looking for analogous uh, uh, areas of study that are totally removed from this world because I, I, for some reason, I find it easier to process them. I'm sure, but I remember one of them that I that I always that always stuck with me is Le Corbusier, right? The Swiss architect, the mm -hmm. modernist, um, invented this thing called the city for a million people, and it was his concept for a a world that would um, house a million people in four buildings for 250,000 person <laughs> buildings and they're beautiful you look at the thing they're these amazing um, uh, what do they what do they call it a transepted building it's, it looks like an X from above right and and these towers and then in the in the rendering that or in the drawing that he did of it it's endless pasture land everywhere around them okay. cows and so forth and his whole thing was we're going to centralize people into these high rises because that's going to free everyone up to then enjoy nature yes. and be out in the world right you look at that thing though now and you go that's a housing project <laughs> i know what that is that's a housing project i've rec i recognize that you know and yeah it'd be great if they put that in the middle of pastures and forests so we could all enjoy ourselves but that's not where those things go you know tom wolf made this argument in in this book um, from bauhaus to our house you know, that, that the academic ideals of modernists in Europe, when they were carried to the United States, became the basis of, of housing projects, became the basis of public housing, and, you know, the worst places to live. Yeah. And so I think that for, for me, it's, it's this thing of, you know, yeah, you know, I don't know if it's exacerbating inequality. I think it's about to, certainly with the automation of, of jobs. And the part that I'm worried about, right, in this book is, is that it's going to exacerbate uh, instincts that have, in the past, led tough directions for, yeah. for human beings. And that well, is certainly a problem. Well, let me ask a last question, because it's kind of a methodology, uh, methodology uh, problem that I'm struggling with. Is yeah. In your book, how are you going to weave these things in? Oh, I mean, just uh, just the practicality John, why, of doing. Why are you bringing me down, man? <laughs> Come on, I was going to have a nice Wednesday. I was going to go to my. I was going to go swan around my Stanford office and think I was doing something. Yeah, how am I going to weave all these things together? You know, so I'm trying very hard to find. Um, you know, I was originally sort of pinning my work entirely to sort of explaining to people, giving people kind of a crash course in behavioral science as uh, with kind of Kahneman and Tversky, who Daniel Kahneman, one of the most famous graduates, of, or graduates, not the right word, but one of the most famous fellows here at CASBIS. Um, we're looking right now where we're sitting in this library, a wall of books, and his is the, one of the prominent ones, all by fellows. Um, and, and so that was going to be the sort of centerpiece. I was going to say, here are the biases that these researchers and others like them have identified and here's where they map to current AI projects and you can see them getting worse. But the problem with hanging out with these people here at Casmus man is that they just they they can't help but sort of complicate your thinking on these things. And so I've gotten, you know, I have political scientists giving me amazing books on on, you know, legitimacy and social uncertainty. I've got, you know, sexual violence researchers giving me books on on how you uh, you know, an institutional betrayal, and you know, I have a, I have a primatologist here, Elizabeth Bonsdorf, right, who's talking us, talking to me about, um, you know, whether AI is going to somehow drive our cognition back toward uh, our, 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 you know, our divorce from the from primates, you know, back toward their kind of instincts. I mean, oh my I God! Love it. So I, I love am it. totally <laughs> overwhelmed at this moment, and but I would say that 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 idea still holds that there is, there is hu there's universal or I don't know, a million academics will groan out loud when I say this, but that there are some universal tenets of human programming and human behavior that we are just beginning to quantify. And, and that code book for the human mind, when you hand it to engineers who then 
feed it into machine learning systems, which are really just pattern recognition systems, Absolutely. I think we're in some real trouble there. Yeah. I think that's gonna, it's gonna hand over a user's manual for our brain in a way that we're maybe not ready for. Well, whenever I find myself in your predicament, which, I, which I'm which i absolutely yeah. in, Help for me. different reasons. Help me, <laughs> Well, I, I just tell myself, as an author, you know, you control both the vertical and the horizontal. So yeah, you've said that to me before, but <laughs> spin, spin that out for me a little well, bit. Well, I mean, so so when I get overwhelmed with stuff, I have to, I have to sort of say, relentlessly narrow it down to a couple of simple ideas mm. and drive them through and you can't do right. everything but you can give people people a narrative yes. and so if you know your narrative and you stick to it I think that's something of value. I think that's really good advice and I know that I mean for all of us I think being overwhelmed as we are by the the pace of change right now by the the things that are being changed I think controlling the horizontal and the vertical is a very smart idea. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for chatting with us today. And for our listeners, take a look at the show notes for this episode for links to some of the topics and organizations we've discussed.